G'day everyone, welcome back to another episode of the Australian Property Investment Podcast. I'm your host, Aaron Christie David, and I run a mortgage broking business called Atelier Wealth, where we specialize in helping property investors start out and scale up their property portfolio. The goal behind putting out each and every episode on the uh, of our podcast was we take frequently asked questions or we take an opportunity to speak to someone who's been there, done that, uh, and lived and breathed the journey of a property investor. Today's special guest has done all of that and more, and I'd almost go as far as calling him wise agent royalty, which uh, he might blush even if I say that, if he could blush. Um, but for me, what I really want to do is take someone's journey uh, unpack it a little bit. Uh, and because Victor has been so accommodating sharing his own journey, whether it's through his book, whether it's through his own uh, podcast or whether being a guest, uh, everyone has been able to, I guess, delve inside his head and go, right, how did you do it? What's got you in the, what got in the way? And then how did you overcome a lot of those barriers and hurdles? And I think that's really the part that we want to have a chat to Victor about. So Victor Kumar, welcome onto the show. Thanks, Aaron. Uh, can I hire you for my PR, mate? Uh, that was a really good introduction. <laughs> I could keep going, mate, because that accolades, I tell you what, um, it's it's inspiring, it's motivating. Uh, yeah, I read your books years ago, um, and I think for me, and I'm going to go kind of a little bit left to center here, I got a lot of encouragement from seeing uh, you know, a fellow migrant, for example, a brother that's come into this country, has done some amazing things. And within the space of one generation, rewritten an entire wealth story. But to me, that intergenerational wealth, we'll, we'll probably have a chat about it in a little bit. Mm. But that's something that I think about. I'm like, literally in the space of what your family has come here into this country to achieve, just rewritten the rules around wealth creation. Yeah, and it is it is really a uh, uh, you know big mind shift change, right? So we, I've been in the country what twenty six odd years. Um, yeah. I came in with uh, four and a half thousand dollars Australian, uh, you know six thousand dollars Fijian, which <laughs> was in real money was four and a half thousand yeah. dollars. And um, uh, you know initially it was actually learning uh, what the successful people um, actually did, and, and the first thing was to define success for myself, right? And yeah. whether whether it was you know a flashy lifestyle, which I don't have. Mm -hmm. um, uh, or whether it was a sustained, uh, well thought out growth plan, both both from a um, money point of view, mm -hmm. but also from a mindset point of view. And I think I think money is secondary. It's the mindset that actually gets you to your goal mm -hmm. uh, and, and your understanding of debt. And 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 with you coming from a mortgage breaking uh, broken background, one of the simple things that people tend to forget is it's not the not the millions of dollars of debt that you have that actually matters. Mm -hmm. It's the amount of zeros you need to come up with per week to hold on to that debt that controls the asset. That's the critical part. Uh, well said, mate. And uh, you've nailed it. The mindset part, anyone can kind of go out there and borrow some money, but it's the ability to pull the triggers sometimes. It's the ability to make those decisions weigh up risk versus reward. And then ultimately that inner voice can be very loud yes, uh, and it can put people off or it can be, Hey, let's go for this and let's address issues as they come up, which I'm sure you've probably had a fair amount of brain damage uh, in that time <laughs> as an investor because uh, I've listened to your story. <laughs> but uh, before we kick off, it's what I like to do is start with the three P's. A bit about yourself personally, a bit about yourself professionally and a bit about your own property journey, which we'll definitely go into more detail as well. Mm -hmm, absolutely. Yeah. So, so personally, uh, obviously, my background really was that I was in the medical field, being you know, a sonographer and a radiographer. Uh, and uh, in two thousand one, I took the plunge and moved into the property sector full time, letting go of my profession, much to the uh, disappointment of my father. <laughs> um, and coming from an ethnic background, you know, medical law or accounting is what we do, or in engineering. Oh, engineering, yeah. <laughs> uh, so, so that that was a that was a big challenge and a big mind shift change. And uh, when I when I look at uh, what I've been able to achieve by simply breaking the paradigm, that's the secret of my success: is uh, thinking things differently. Yeah. Uh, and and um, uh, what was the other piece? Sorry. So. Uh, personally, so I've heard your story about how you've come to Australia. Mm -hmm. so for viewers, uh, listeners that haven't, uh, you came to this country from Fiji in, I'm going to say 97. Uh, 97, yes. Yeah, with your wife. 
and then yeah, since then have gone into a mass quite a large mm. property portfolio. So then I think we also chatted. You got you got two kids, so you're at that stage of life where yes, probably uh, the dad uh, role and then the business owner role. Because uh, yeah, this is part two because we've had a chat with Steve, your business yeah. partner from Right Property Group. So, but I guess your your professional journey and how that's evolved mm. moving into property full time as well. Absolutely, and 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 the reality of it is right, that I, I, I'm a product of life experience, not 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 a. Uh, done a course and and hung up my shingle to do um, uh, you know property buyers advocacy. Mm-hmm. So the the advice that I give to my clients uh, is from real life of things that I've done well in my life uh, in terms of property and things that I haven't done so well. Uh, so it comes in with the battle scars so that people yeah. don't have to necessarily make that mis- make those mistakes. Um, and, and it's still a learning process, right? I, I learn through my clients. I learn through uh, interaction with with uh, everyone around me uh, and uh, it's it's one of those things where you get an aha moment on something that's so um, uh, f- uh, front of mind all the time but you, you get a different perspective when you talk to different people yeah. because we all bring our different sets of experiences right and and one of the biggest thing that that um, I, you know I advocate in terms of property is that if you um, do what everyone else is doing. You'll get everyone else's result, right? This is, you'll get the general result. You need to specialize in terms of what you're trying to achieve in property and then hone it down in terms of uh, the type of property you're buying. And it dare say, you may want to be counter cyclical and, uh, and invest away from the media where the media hype is. Um, but again, investing within your means. And th- these are things that I learned along the way through my own journey, which I then... Um, certainly advocate for my clients. And then naturally, one of the biggest thing that people tend to um, do in terms of a mistake is that they focus too much on the growth, forgetting the other side of the coin. So it, it's a lever, mm-hmm. right? So you need to balance it out in the sense that one side's cash flow, the other side's growth. You balance it within what your means are and you can never go wrong. It, it may be that you are a bit delayed in terms of, the goal, the end goal. Yeah. But you need to actually make sure that you uh, have a really clear end goal, which then sorts out the process in the background. Yeah. No, we'll we'll say, we'll say. And before we do continue, I mean, this is, um, this is all really great um, insights, Victor. This uh, podcast and this chat is going to be general in nature and not intended to give advice. So if you do need advice, please seek out a uh, trained and paid professional to help you on your journey as well. Uh, Victor, one of the things that I really want to kind of pick your brain on was you came to this country again with not a lot of money, um, started out kind of grassroots, you know, probably renting, and then you bought your own home. Then quickly amassed a portfolio and it's, it's openly documented. So probably about what, 11, 12 properties in that next year, couple of years. Mm-hmm. That's, uh, that's rapid growth. And for most people are going, the first question is how, like how yeah. does that happen so quickly for yourself? Hmm. Yeah, so, so the um, um, first thing that, that we need to understand is that um, the rapidity of acquisition and the number of properties is irrelevant. Right? Mm-hmm. That, that is something I learned over the years. right? And, and initially, I was more in the numbers game. So how many properties can I buy? Yeah. Uh, and I went out and, and deliberately spent a lot of money. Uh, so myself and my wife, um, we, we spent a lot of money buying courses, attending courses, uh, both from a, from a business point of view. So property is a business. Yeah. So we needed to understand business, property itself, property seminars, uh, and then also mindset seminars as well, right? So uh, our, our, our turning point really, uh, if, I, if I look back, uh, was attending uh, Anthony Robbins seminar, which just sort of Isn't that where the magic opened happens? up the mind. It, magic happened after that, right? Yeah. And, and um um, I was very skeptical going into that, that, uh, and, and I was actually put onto that. I'm an avid reader, right? Yeah. So I, I read a lot and I had read all the books and these days I don't read as much. I, I listen to them because I'm still vain. I don't want to use eyeglasses. <laughs> <laughs> um, so it, you know, I, I listen to the books instead, but I've read a whole lot of books on business. And, and one of the books I picked up, um, while I was still doing radiography was, uh, Anthony Robbins book, um, and as I was reading it during my break, um, uh, and, and at um, at the X-ray center, the radiologist uh, 
couple more zeros in the salary. Uh, a radiologist um, came and said, oh, I see you reading in Anthony Robbins' book. I, I'm a, a platinum member. Um, he, he, I can get you a discount. And wow. that's how I ended up in the, in the seminar. Right? Yeah. And that changed the course of my life uh, in that sense uh, from achieving mediocre results, still good at that point in time to achieving phenomenal results, both in, both in life and in property. Now, if I were to relive it again, one of the strong recommendations I would have is that investing should happen in the background, life should happen in the forefront. Mm -hmm. One of the mistakes I've made is that we didn't have a social life. Um, while we're building the initial portfolio, uh, we um, delayed our kids uh, yeah. in that sense. So now uh, the downside of it is that we had to rebuild our social circles um, when, when we're ready. And importantly, the age that my kids are, I'm now um, um, mixing around with with uh, friends and, and family that either the kids are much younger uh, or they're much older because mm -hmm. um, uh, and therefore the outlook in life is different and the kids can't get to socialize in the right age groups as well. So there are always pros and cons in terms of journeys that you, you can look back and say, you know what, uh, I wish I'd done it differently. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, everything you're saying there is everything that I feel like we've, myself and Bernard, our, my wife has been on the same journey. Tony Robbins, Unleash the Power Within was one of the best investments mm -hmm. we've made into ourselves in terms of mindset, in terms of being on the same page as a couple as well. Yep. I think that's probably the one one big thing that I say to a lot of our couple clients, which is you can't build a house with two different blueprints. You need to be on the same page. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that's one thing that you know, Unleash the Power or any Tony Robbins type of, event, type of event, so it doesn't have to be him specifically, but that immersion type event where you just go like all in on what are we trying to do here and achieve together and even just – family planning it takes either years to conceive when you're stressed or starting out and mm -hmm. um and then the next part is yeah i think everyone's running their own race so that time served you both right like to to be double income no kids for example and to be all in on the property side but then you go well what's the property side without the family side exactly i think yeah. balance in life right so right. a real balance in life not 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 the textbook stuff yeah, correct. And, and and exactly what you're saying here is we are our greatest asset. So when I'm talking, like, again, I feel like well, there's a great alignment. When we're talking to clients, they think that property is their greatest asset. I'm like, no, no, you are your greatest asset. You will earn more in your lifetime than rather than property can. Or, mm -hmm. And then invest, don't invest in property, invest in yourself. Yes. You get a far better return on investment. Mm. I agree. Of, yeah. yeah. And, and so, we thought it was a property podcast, right? That's exactly it. <laughs> Some people talk, they think I'm talking woo woo, but I'm like, seriously, the best investment we will make is into our own, in, into our own um, yep. interests, into our own self-development as well. So yeah. And that, that way you don't get swayed with all the white noise that is out there because the biggest curse uh, investing has at the moment is that there's too much information out there, right? It's just like yeah. drinking out of a fire hydrant. Yeah. Um, you know, you, you don't know what to consume and, and you just get drowned with all of that information. Yeah. Uh, and if you bring it back to basics, you really need to map out first what you're trying to achieve as, a, as opposed to the standard approach is that, hey, it's time to buy a property because you know that's the thing to do. Yeah. And they jump in and whatever resonates best with them, they jump into that asset class, right? Whether it's yeah. a house and land package, whether it's a renovation, whether it's a unit or uh, the, the, the most negative filter out there, buying it because eventually I'm going to live in it uh, when I retire mm -hmm. uh, in that sense. So... Uh, if we can divorce the white noise away from, from investing and come back to the fundamentals of, okay, what are we really trying to achieve and what are we willing to sacrifice along the way from a cash flow point of view? Yeah. Um, it, the journey becomes really easy and it actually does then allow you to buy in a very sedate, planned way. It also is easy to flag when it is time to stop buying because one of the biggest things people um, uh, perhaps make a mistake on is that they don't know when to stop uh, because they don't actually know what they've already got um, and making sure that it doesn't become a numbers game from an accumulation of number of properties point of view. It's the end result in terms of what's the cash flow we're trying to get. Not necessarily the equity. Equity is really good, but equity gives you the wealth, right? You mm -hmm. can't necessarily spend the wealth yeah. Whereas the cash flow, in other words, the the rent that is freed up as you as you minimize the debt, uh, that's what gives you the lifestyle. So when you're talking to 
because there's got to be a disparity when you're talking to a 20 something year old buying their first property versus uh, maybe a couple in their forties thinking about, you know, Mm -hmm. replacing their day job with property prosperity, for example, um, there's got to be different asset you know, choices. There's got to be a different strategy here, different conversation as well. So how do you, I guess, have a different type of conversation where someone's got time on their side versus someone that's maybe getting on in life? And then the other part to that question is the younger person generally has far more a risk appetite because um, they've got time on their side, but they don't necessarily mm-hmm. have the means. They have the borrowing capacity, they don't have the cash, whereas you speak to older couples, they've got the cash, they've got the borrowing capacity or equity, but they have less uh, aversion to risk. And they're like, well, what happens if it goes wrong? And that almost flips it around on its head. So how do you kind of tailor your conversation? Yeah, and that, that, that's a brilliant question, right? Because that, that is something that, that most people don't take into account uh, is the fact that one size does not fit all in property investing, right? So we need to take several variables into account. So one is the age factor. The second is the actual time frame you're giving yourself to get to the goal, right? And and so hence the goal itself. Uh, and the third is the amount of capital that you've got to play with uh, and the lending climate at that point in time. And then the fourth is the amount of cash flow that you can tolerate negative before tax to hold on to this portfolio. So not taking tax into account because tax laws could change, right? So when we, when we address these variables, it gives us a, a, a aiming point to say, okay, this, this is the likely asset class that we can go with, right? So someone that's a 20 or 20 year old, uh, it will have a vastly different starting point portfolio as opposed to someone that say, say 45, because um, we, 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 we've got, less time to correct the mistakes. Mm. And so there's less speculation in inverted commas uh, with the 45-year-old as there is with the 20-year-old. Like you said, we've got plenty of time. Uh, But we still need to be bringing it back to 10-year trenches to say that this is the plan for the portfolio for the next 10 years. And and make it, if if you're 20 something, make it a rolling 10 year, make it a rolling decade. So, you know, this is a milestone for this first decade. And the second decade milestone could be that, well, we're actually concentrating on getting rid of all the negative cash flow, we're getting rid of a majority portion of the debt. How do you do that? There's only three ways to pay down the loans through surplus PAYG income, mm. through surplus business or portfolio income. So, turning the loans into principal and interest, as an example, yeah. um, and, and adding a granny flat or a secondary dwelling into within the portfolio. And the third is uh, you sell something, you know, sell a business, sell property, sell tomatoes for the, for that matter, right? You're selling something to create that capital to to um, um, pay down the loans. Yeah. And this is where a lot of people get hung up in terms of they all go in with the thought process of, I'm going to purchase X number of properties. I'm going to purchase X value of properties, depending on what what the approach is. Um, And I'm going to purchase in these areas because that's where the Facebook ads show me to buy. Um, And something magical will happen and I'll get the result of of getting the cash flow. Or they might not even have thought it out that far. Human nature is that we are right here, right now. We tend not to think that far ahead, right? So when you're purchasing a property, that's why we strongly advocate that you have to have an aiming point. And that aiming point, that end goal changes over time as your experience changes, as your um, outlook to life changes, as your life changes in in the sense that as you grow older you you we were we we're discussing offline that you know as as we've gone through journey as kids arrive our perspectives change as business improves our perspectives change yeah. uh, in terms of where and what and how we're doing things so all of those need to be taken into account as you as you're getting into the journey right you need to be in property investing you need to be looking at the get out first before you look at the get in Right. Most people look at it in the sense that how can I get in? And, and they, they try and buy a property. So the differentiator factor in a uh, in a portfolio that's with a 20-year-old as opposed to, say, a 45, 50-year-old is the, the how we look at the get out. With a 20-year-old, it could be that we're just looking at the normal market patterns, still a good buy and hold or still a good good property with some some added benefits of heading a granny flat or subdivision down track where we are letting time do its magic. Now, it's more of a, uh, more of a hands-off approach, unless, of course, 
your end goal is in a shorter time frame, right? You're not waiting till the prescribed retirement age. You want to retire a lot early. Um, whereas the 45 year old, the 50 year old, uh, we need to be a lot more independent of the property cycle itself. So we're creating the value within the property uh, against the market flow. So it could be that we're getting into more of a renovation type property or uh, a property where we can at some point in time do the subdivision because that's a very strong get out clause yeah. of that property, right? Yeah. Uh, regardless of what happens. But all of this is irrelevant unless you can borrow the money. So property investing really is a game of finance. It's not a game of properties. It's a game of finance. Mm -hmm. If you can get the money, cheaply enough and, and you can leverage well enough, you'll do well so long as you've got enough time on your side. Yeah. And that's that's a line that comes out a fair bit. So for example, in our line of work, which is the lending side, it's like, hey, it's a game of finance and people think that you're playing in gray areas. That doesn't sound like you play with a straight bat, for example. Uh, and I <laughs> guess there's, and that's the beauty of having multiple banks with multiple policies, for example, some mm. banks are more open to investors than others, right? So take me through how has your how has your uh, portfolio been able to springboard and, and scale mm. in the context of it being a game of finance? Yeah, and, and that that's a, that's a really good way of, of putting it, right? So if I look at my journey, uh, in and I, I came, as you know, um, into Australia in 97. Um, it was actually almost a month and a half ago. So 26 February uh, 1997 uh, nice. is when I yeah. arrived, right? So um it, we had four and a half thousand dollars mm. uh, and that went really quickly because we had to buy a, you know r the basics yeah. uh, and then um we didn't we lived a really frugal life right we saved a lot and and uh, the first thing i did was that um uh, you know i tried to go out and get a loan and um the um i still remember to this day that um for for the sydney siders uh you know we were living in liverpool and um uh, there was a Westpac and and because I banked with Westpac in Fiji, yeah. uh, it is natural that I'd go to Westpac over here, right? Force of habit uh, and, and familiarity. So we went to Westpac and, and um, I um, uh, I asked for a home loan because I had $13,000 saved at the time, right? Yeah. Um, and uh, the, um, the loans officer, because I'd made an appointment, the loans officer, uh, she looked at me and said, I can't really give you money because you don't have a credit rating, right? So um, I asked her for advice and she, she said, get a credit card, right? <laughs> so that was my first two and a half thousand dollar credit card, yeah. right? Now, uh, I was so upset that, you know, I, I wasn't able to get a loan that I forgot I actually had a car and I walked back to my unit. Uh, and uh, it, later later that uh, that day when Reshmi, my wife, came back home and said, well, where's the car? And I realized that I'd parked in the court of our parking zone, yeah. but uh, didn't get a ticket or anything like that. But that that became the, the journey. And then uh, I guess it's a little bit of a, um, not a cavalier approach, but a mindset shift that I had. Mm -hmm. I said, you know what? If it's meant to be, it's meant to be. I'll, I'll, I'll go out and start looking for a home. Right? I would not recommend that today in today's market. Right, but back then, um, that's what I did. So we we found a home. Uh, we paid one hundred and thirty seven thousand dollars for it, Beautiful. and then I turned around to the agent. That's a three bedroom house in Camden. Um, you know, a 12, 15 year old home at the time. Yeah. Um, nothing to write home about, right? But um, it was home. Uh, and, and this is intuitively, I was doing something that was different to what my fellow migrants were doing. Which was they were they were getting into the 250, 300k home at that time in right. in in more flashier homes. Whereas I naturally gravitated to you know let let's buy this. It'll be safe. It's um um uh, you know it's something that if things went wrong, I would be able to sell out. Right. That was my approach. Yeah. You know, at the time, uh, and uh, I turned around to the agent. And I said, Oh, by the way, I haven't got any finance. Right. He put me in touch with a mortgage broker. Right. And. Uh, this is where I discovered the joys and the advantage of having mm -hmm. a mortgage broker uh, in the sense that I had just gone to Westpac, right? And they had said no. Whereas, um, and I'm going to mention uh, some some lending institutions here. Uh, that doesn't mean that you have to go to those institutions. Um, so the guy took me to uh, AMP. Yeah. And and, and actually, uh, concurrently, I also went with ANZ, uh, directly and, and I got approvals for both. And I remember my solicitor calling me who was doing the conveyancing, who are you going to go with, right? I, I thought, well, this guy's done all the work, right? I'll, I'll go with him. 
Yeah. And um, the other advantage was that at that time, AMP was giving an incentive of giving you an IBM computer uh, when you settle the loan, right? So that be, that became my decision making process, yeah. right? And and so we were able to get ninety five percent at that time or ninety seven percent loan, right? Okay, now, yeah. Those those things at the time were around. Yeah. Um, and the interest rate was seven percent. Right, right. So if you're talking right now, everyone's screaming and jumping up at five and a half percent, try seven and nine percent. Yeah. Yeah. And and my income was a whole lot lower at the time. Uh, and then my first property really, um, I didn't know how to structure finance. And and uh, when I picked up the phone to the broker, um, me and after after the loan settled, I said, I'm, I'm, I think I'll be ready for the next one as soon as I can get um, you know approval and all this. I don't know the process. Uh, he was quite dismissive and said, "You know what? Come back when you're ready," um, which mm-hmm. is is a good segue to you know if you if you're looking to be successful in property, you need to be latching onto a financier, a broker uh, that has actually gone the journey in terms of investing that specializes in in what you're trying to do, right? So yeah. they're they're brokers that specialize in first home buyers, as an example. They're brokers that that specialize in credit impaired loans. Mm-hmm. Um, so you need to look at someone that's helping investors as an example, if you're investing. Um, so um, we had a payout because I had a back injury in, yeah. and, uh, when I was working at Liverpool Hospital. Right? Yeah. And uh, through work cover, I had a massive payout, $8,000. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there might be an extra zero or two in there. But yeah, <laughs> no, I didn't know. I, I, I got I got bullied by the solicitors uh, to, to accept the 8 <laughs> Um, and uh, at that time, I was just starting to read uh, Jen Summers' book. If, if anyone's just starting out on property investing, even though this book is a bit dated, the yes. principles are really good. Jen Summers, S O M E R S. Originals, yeah. really, isn't she? Pine yeah, absolutely. absolutely. She, she was one of the pioneers of, yeah. of uh, property investment books, right? Yeah. So I, I was reading that at the time. And I still couldn't make head or tail out of it. So what I did was that I've got eight thousand. That's enough of a deposit. Let's find let's find an investment property because I knew mm. that was a natural progression. Now I had the option. All of my all of the advice I was getting from my fellow um, um, fellow countrymen and and for all the friends that I'd made over here is that put that eight thousand into your home loan, right? Mm. But I I chose differently, and. This is where you need to understand where the advice is coming from, right? Is it coming from fear? Is it coming from well-meaning, good advice, but no backing in terms of experience, life experience? Or is it coming from life experience, right? So you need to understand where the advice is coming from. Um, so the advice was that put it in the home loan. I chose differently. I um, put that against a unit. Uh, and um, it was in an area that had not seen any growth. I didn't know what to research. It just, the numbers seemed to work, right? It was yeah. $70,000 unit. Uh, the rent on it was $130 a week, 7%. I couldn't make yeah. it fail. Uh, even with the strata, um, it was yeah. okay. And um, that became my first investment property. And I remember uh, Reshmi, my wife, and I squabbling over the windowsill having a few um, um, you know, rotted bits and uh, how she was hung up on that, whereas I was more hung up on, uh, you know, she's, I think there's a bullet hole in the window. Uh, but that didn't deter me. Um, and that that wasn't really a bullet hole. Um, and uh, that became my first investment property. And once once we settled and, and my wife and I sat down and had a look at the numbers, we realized that I could build equity, I could build cash flow, I could build... Um, a portfolio faster than I could actually pay down the home loan in that sense, mm-hmm. right? So uh, if I had the $8,000, if I put that into the home loan and forgotten about the investing side of it, yes, that was $8,000 off the principal of the loan, but I'm only tiered to the growth in that property itself. Whereas if I could leverage it out to different properties, the leverage allowed me to control a whole lot more growth and my initial thought process at that time was that, well, when this doubles in value, I'm going to sell and I'll pay down my home loan, right? Well, but I'll tell you now that I haven't paid down my home loan. But I've, I've paid it down, I've re-leveraged and, and gone into bigger and better things, right? As a life uh, change in terms of initially, I was taking a whole lot of speculative risk. Speculative risk because I didn't know any better. So it was it was more of optimistic approach 
Yeah. As opposed to uh, making sure that all the boxes were ticked, right? And this is the importance when you when you are investing in property, is understanding that it's if if it's a husband and wife team or or, or a um, uh, you know two people investing together, it is a partnership, right? So uh, it's a yin and yang. If if I if I become woo woo, uh, awesome. in that sense, um, that um, I was the go go go. And uh, Reshmi, my wife, was okay. Hang on, let's look at this. You know, uh, let uh, will it, what, what if it goes wrong? No? And and as the portfolio um, developed, the roles switched. Yeah, the yeah. roles actually switched. Now, now Reshmi is the go 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 go, and I'm the like, oh whoa. Uh, let's see what what we've got first. Let let's look at the fundamentals. Let let's look at the cash flow. What if this goes wrong? What if goes? So mm -hmm. I'm more into risk mitigation and taking a, a very mitigated approach, whereas the the role reversal is that she's now okay. We haven't we haven't we haven't reached our goals. You know what's happening? What's happening? So it's important to understand that growth and roles can can change. But the important bit is that both of you need to be on the same page in terms of what you're trying to achieve yes. and also on the same page in terms of expenditure, household budgets, uh, what you, you know, what you, what you're putting on the back burner, uh, but importantly, not putting life in the back burner. Mm. So on that very point, um, I'm going to make a couple of assumptions here, right? And because you said this, like I paid off my home, lived on my lane, lived on my means. So, your property portfolio would sit probably amongst Australia's top tier property investors. I'm not going to blow it wide open because I know you like to just yeah you know, stay a little bit humble, but it's it's probably no secret that it sits right up there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So your home's paid off. Your business has been around for quite some time yourself and Steve. So it's obviously a well run business. It's a it's a great organisation. It's stood the test of time. It's pr profitable. I'm assuming as well. But I don't see a fancy watch on the wrist. I don't, know I don't wear watches actually. Well, there we go, right? And so, and there's a story behind that as well. Yeah, and that's what I really want to have a chat about because how do you not then let that cash flow that's coming in lifestyle creep? How do you not then go, okay, well, look, we're set. The properties are doing really well. We can afford to splurge on a really nice car or expensive watches, for example. So, I guess some of those trappings mm -hmm. that catch out a lot of people. How have you avoided maybe not going down that path and keeping your feet on the ground a little bit as well? Yeah, and that's really important, right? So uh, one of the things that I always, always acknowledge, and 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 this is routine on a daily basis, is actually acknowledging where I came from. Yeah. As in financial and 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 background, family background. Uh, you know, I came from a farming community where um, I still distinctly remember my my dad and mum going into what was called BNZ Bank of New Zealand, which is now ANZ in mm. Fiji. Um, and I still remember the smell because that was the only air conditioned um, building in, you know, in our uh, country town. Right. Yeah. Uh, so it had that sharp cold smell when, when you open the door and they would sit downstairs. So loans department was upstairs, right? We come from farming background. So loans department was upstairs. Um, and the tellers and the cashiers and all that were downstairs, right? So they will sit downstairs until they were sure that there was no one downstairs that knew them. Yeah. And that would scoot upstairs to get to the loans department. That was the stigma, right? That mm -hmm. was the stigma of getting debt. So I remind myself of that often mm -hmm. to say that let's not get carried away. Yet I still live life, right? I, I do have, uh, you know, a few expensive cars. Yeah. Um, uh, I definitely don't have any watches yeah. <laughs> in a sense because um, um, the the story behind the watch was that I actually um, put a flashy goal in front of myself. When I, 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 if I can use the word wankress goal <laughs> <laughs> myself, um, uh, where if I got to 31 properties, I would, I would uh, buy myself a watch. This is years ago, right? Yeah. Just before the GFC. And um uh, at that time I was um you know the watch that I was going to buy was a Rado, um, yeah. um if I'm pronouncing it right. Um and at that time it was an eleven thousand dollar watch back then, yeah. right? And when I actually reached that goal, I realized that hang on, I I, I actually miss um I missed the 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 whole gist of this that this is not the number of properties that we are after it's the end goal so mm -hmm. i deliberately don't wear watches 
to remind myself that it's not about the number of properties. It's about the end cash flow. It's about paying off the mortgages. It's about living your journey, running your journey in property, and not trying to compete against someone else. Because I was attending these seminars where people had you know, 100 properties and, and some of them were a bit embellished in that mm. sense. Uh, there are others that you know had bought three properties in one year, that sort of thing. And I got into that competition mode. Yeah. And to remind myself not to get into the competition mode, keep it grounded, keep it within within the lane to make sure that I, I'm running my own journey towards my own goal. And these goals change. These goals change. My initial goal in property was to get 37K positive cash flow. <laughs> I can tell you now that I've surpassed that, you know, 10 times over. Yeah. <laughs> You know, and, and that's no exaggeration, right? Yeah. So that's why uh, I, I I don't wear watches. Um, now, in terms of trappings of life, um, yes, we do go to expensive holidays. We do we do have um, you know a nice home, that sort of thing. Um, but with 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 my kids as well, they understand the value of money, not not what it can buy, but what you need. If all of this was taken away, mm. what do you need to do from a mindset point of view and not taking things for granted? Yeah. Uh, so there's such, uh, to me, I'm like, there's such great lessons that, and you spoke about your parents, our money beliefs, our money relationship, for example, will often come out of how our parents perceive money, how our parents talked about money, whether they feared it, whether they managed it, whether they managed them, for example. And I find that that's, that's a very common mindset, which is debt is evil, for example. We don't need to borrow mm -hmm. more than what we can. Live within, you know, live within your means and don't show. But I think there's a part of your journey, which is, but if I've achieved it, why can't I share my journey with other people? Why can't I inspire the next generation? Why can't I pay this forward? That lifts other people up rather than being uh, a show off about it as mm -hmm. well. There's got to be a way that you can flip it on its head going, no, let's use my story as a way of a blueprint for people that want to aspire to then rewrite their wealth story there is a way, there's a pathway that you can follow as well. Yeah, absolutely. And and then because there's so much white noise out there, right? People do get distracted. People do get sidetracked, right? And 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 one of the things I introduced into RPG was the review process where every year without fail, we sit down, whether, whether you're in the buying process or not, mm -hmm. we sit down with you to actually go through the moving parts of the portfolio and to rehash um, or, or revisit the original goal to see how that's changed because life changes, right? And and um, this is testimony to normal life. There are people that take advantage of this review process. There are others that you know we'd follow up and, and actively try and get them you know back into a review, but they say no, no, I'm okay, right? So mm -hmm. each person's journey is their own. It's uh, it's a matter of making sure that we don't get too swayed and don't get too caught up in in the numbers game. Yeah. The see. only numbers game you got to get caught up is the cash flow, right? How much cash flow are you chipping in or how much cash flow are you getting out of the portfolio? Yeah, okay. Yeah, perfect. Um, and your book, what's inspired? I know it's been out for quite some time, but I mean, it stands the test of time when the principles are, are true and it comes from a place of care and love. So take us through what what, what inspired the book and how's that, how's that helped other investors yeah. on their journey as well? Fantastic. So the book's called Supercharge Your Property Portfolio. And, and I chose that that title quite deliberately uh, because uh, that's that's what it does, right? And and what it what it talks about really is the various strategies you can use in the changing market. So whether it's a up market, down market, sideways, boom market, bust market, uh, so long as you can implement those strategies, you it'll keep you safe. And um, what it gives you is real life examples from my own portfolio, what I've done wrong and what I've done right. Um, and um, it, it helps you formulate a plan. Uh, and more importantly, it actually gets you to question the paradigm as to this is what everyone else does. Does this fit with what I'm trying to achieve? If it does tick, yeah, let's go ahead and do that. Yeah. Uh, and it also um, uh, allows you to then question the norm of, okay, uh, this bank's going to give me half a percent less in interest rate. Do I go with this bank or do I go with that bank, right? So uh, I take all of that, that away to say, it's not about the interest rate. The mm -hmm. first thing you need to be looking at is the product, right? Okay. Then you're looking at what the product can do for you Interest rate is probably the tenth thing that you look at within reason, right? If, if you, right. Uh, you know, especially at, at the phase where the market is right now, 
you want to leverage as much as you can and and uh, accumulate um, within reason yeah. the good quality properties rather than you know if you're going to a to a, a lender that's giving you say one percent cheaper but it forces you into a 250k purchase as opposed to another lender that's actually three percent more mm. but it gives you 750. I'll go for the 750 any day of the week provided I can afford the cash flow. Remember how I said in the beginning, it's it's a game of finance. That's exactly. I think uh, for us, where we see the bigger picture, we, are, we will deal with clients that will that will lose sleep over the 0.05% on a rate. And I say to mm-hmm. our clients, either, I'm like, if you think it's about the interest rate, you've missed the point. That property is going to do far heavier lifting in terms of its growth or its cash flow than 0.05% cheaper on a rate. But I guess everyone's been conditioned to get the lowest rate as possible without realizing that it may cut off or shave 60, 80, hundred thousand dollars off their borrowing capacity. Now they're forced to buy in like a lower quality property. Cause they've got to buy in that price range, as opposed to just what you said, stretch yourself a little bit more, gives you the ability to buy a superior property. That's going to get a better return on investment. The interest rate becomes irrelevant at that point. Mm-hmm. as well. Yep. And that's knowing that, when you're building a portfolio, right, you've got the overall cash flow. Yeah. And then then what's this property bringing as a negative or positive cash flow? So it's like a, you know, you've, you've got the end picture, right? Like a jigsaw puzzle and you're putting in the pieces. You need to put the pieces in at the right order in yeah. the right area and, and so that you can unfold the full picture. And uh, it could be that you're purchasing a property and then that means that your cash flow is quite constrained and stops you from buying the next one yeah. until you've managed the cash on this. It, and that, that, how would that, that look like? It may look like restructuring the entire portfolio from a mortgage point of view to get the cheaper efficiencies. Yeah. So turning your principal interest into interest only again, uh, if the lender permits. Um, and also maybe perhaps bringing forward a secondary dwelling construction um, you know, high level numbers, right? You're building a granny flat in Sydney. It'll cost you around 200K. And yeah. your rent would be, depending on the area, anywhere from 350 to 500, uh, even more um, in, in some, some areas. So those numbers are really good, but you still need to look at the overall impact, right? Do you also then looking at, um, look, the way I built my portfolio, I built it in silos, right? So, uh, or, or, or pods, so yeah. to speak, right? So in, in in each pod, so it's a set, forget. So, you know, the first property I buy, and the order is not important, right? Yeah. So the, the types of properties I buy, uh, one is a get out of jail card property. So it could be something that's a really good um, equity gain because of a, a renovation that you've done, a, a efficient renovation. So not not getting into structural renovations as such, right? Um, then the other property could be a, a, a house or a unit that is very easy to pay off. It's looking after itself on its own. Yeah. But introduced within that portfolio, it's it's still negative um, uh, overall. Uh, and then you've got your neutralizer property or your cash flow property. So this is one where you perhaps bought it and it's got really good cash flow, not no not regional or mining towns, so it's still metropolitan areas. So really yeah. good cash flow, um, where you're actually manufacturing the cash flow as an example. So it could be that you're building another house on it, um, or building another uh, granny flat on it. And then the fourth property is your generational property, right? So this is where you have got a big play on it. it now, it could be something that, say, right, if, if I'm just talking Sydney market as an example, the inner west, right? Mm. Big price, big ticket items, that's the jewel in the crown. You're going to keep it for generations. And the true benefit is perhaps reaped by the next generation as such, or the full development of it is done by the next generation. When you've got all of those properties together, your net cash flow, regardless of rate, within reason, yeah. is perhaps zero, if not positive, right? So you now set and forget it does not impact lifestyle. It happens in the background. You can work on the next pod of properties. Oh, nice um, and I'll, I'll give you some examples within my portfolio, right? So um, the uh, easy to pay down and and. Coincidentally, I, um, because the numbers work uh, and, and the examples really fresh in my mind because I've just worked on that on the pod, um, these are all properties in, in Brisbane. That doesn't mean they have to be all in Brisbane. Yeah. Um, I've got properties across most of the states in Australia, right? And, and these pods are across Australia as well. So um, the get out of jail, um, sorry, the, the pay down property was a 165K purchase. It was a two bedroom unit 
the rent on it is three hundred dollars a week nice. today. Yeah, strata on it is about two thousand dollars a year, so it's not heavy strata as such, right? But it looks after itself. Yeah, uh, yeah. I could sell it because I've held it for about seven years now. Yeah. Uh, I could sell it for a small profit. It's not going to break any records in terms of growth. But yeah. it's, it's it's 165k loan, very easy to pay down, right? Yeah. Then the next property I added into that was a house where uh, we picked it up for, um, and this again, talking seven years ago, we yeah. picked it up for 225k. Um, needed 45k renovation back then. The valuation, bank valuation back then came back at 380. Oh, right. Yeah. So yeah. I didn't access the equity out. I left the equity in the property. So that's my, if things went horribly wrong, um, you know, the world ended, yeah. um, I am able to sell this property and walk away with 50, 60, hundred K. Yep. Depending how you do the numbers. Yeah. And then I've got a corner block, uh, where I purchased this house for, um, 400 K have got a approval to put a granny flat or a three bedroom home, depending on which way we, we lean on yeah. this. Haven't done it yet. The property itself looks after itself. The, the rent on it is a six twenty. Um, if I were to balance out the cash flow, um, I don't need to. But if I needed to balance out the cash flow, I would put the um, a secondary dwelling on. That'll get similar rent, and that'll be that'll wash out all of the negative cash flow within the portfolio, right? Mm. And then the generational property I've got in that pod is a six acre block with two houses on it, where across the road there's been subdivisions on it. Uh-huh. I've got no intentions of doing the subdivisions. The kids can do that in their lifetime, right? So that's the generation. So it's a set and forget that does not take into account, uh, does not suck any money away from me anymore, uh, even at this higher rate as such. And if I bring that to, say, Sydney, similar, um, and they, they don't need to be all in the one state, right? Now, I've talked about a lot of properties. It, it doesn't have to be five or six properties. It could be just the two properties, right? So you need to be looking at it from that viewpoint of what the strategies are, what 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 my get out of jail card is, mm. uh, how can I really leverage of the value that time gives me in materializing yeah. the two things that we want out of property, cash flow and growth. Yeah, nice one. Well explained. Uh, I think it's, feel, it's quite a unique way of looking at it because you, know, you hear people that buy properties in pairs, cash flow, capital growth, for example, but to have a pot of different styles of properties and mm-hmm. the way they do their heavy lifting inside your portfolio, super, super unique, mate. So yeah. Thank you very much for Look, that. I'm glad you mentioned the pairs of properties because you know, uh, you know uh, I guess the listeners would be thinking, oh, I can't afford five properties. No, mm. it, it, it's beyond my means. I can't even comprehend holding five properties. <laughs> so, uh, the way I get my clients started out is actually what I call pigeon pairing, right? So yeah. you have a high growth property, um, which still has got the ability uh, and, and it comes with a bit of negative cash flow, but mm. still has got the ability to neutralize the negative cash flow. Yeah. And then cor- uh, correspondingly, I've got a higher cash flow property elsewhere. So as an example, it could be a house in Victoria and, um, you know, house in, Brisbane uh, or Perth because they are the better cash flow properties. Yeah, with them combined, it reduces the negative cash flow. It may not wash it out completely, but it reduces the negative cash flow significantly. So um, you've got the growth, but you've still got the ability to neutralize that negative cash flow within that growth property. Yeah. Uh, so it could have a subdivision potential or could have a dual occupancy potential. Not that you're going to pull the trigger, but if if you're getting close to retirement and you you're thinking, you know what? Um, I want to reduce my debt. One of the ways to reduce the debt is carve the land off, sell it, keep the front house, mm-hmm. provided it's in good nick, and it reduces the debt, right? Uh, everything needs to point towards actually paying the loans off. It, nothing magical will happen in the end to say that you'll get the cash flow unless you get the loans down. The old adage of hold the property long enough and uh, your uh, debt would be so minuscule in comparison to the to the equity position in the property that it it's irrelevant, right? Now that's on the assumption that's built on the assumption that uh, you, your rent or your return on that property is going to be five percent of the value of the property. Yeah. It does not always happen, right? The, your your rents have got a natural ceiling to the area, yeah. and this is really a forty year strategy that on paper works really well, 
and that's that that's the that's the issue with most people when they're investing is that they have this u butte plants built up that is linear in nature mm. whereas Property investing is not linear. The growth is not linear in that sense, right? It goes up, down, sideways. Um, some sometimes you have uh, the external factors of interest rates, the external factors of job losses, all of that. So on the property and yeah, correct aging. Yeah, yeah. So you know, it, it you can't you can't have a linear projection um, when you look at most of these calculators online and. Um, um, and I mentioned Jen Summers uh, mm. in the beginning. Uh, one of the things that uh, Ian, the, the uh, her husband, uh, put together was a, um, a calculator or, or a um, ready reckoner of what the portfolio is going to cost you, right? Yes. You can't play around with the interest rate. You can't play around with the growth. Each property would have this relatively the same interest rate and all that. So therefore, it's still linear. You can't say that year one is going to be this interest rate, this growth. And the reality is, how do you know in year 10, that the interest rate is going to be 5% or 20%. Yeah. We don't know. Piti, you've been super, super generous with your time and your insights, mate. I want to say a real thank you. I have no doubt that this episode is going to resonate with a lot with um, newer investors, experienced investors as well, and even people that are just starting out buying their home but have aspirations to grow a property portfolio in the future. Regardless of size, we talk about quality over quantity. And yes. uh, I'm glad you've reiterated that message as well, mate. So I want to say thank you so much for sharing um, I'm going to ask a favor. Do you think we can grab a couple of books for some listeners as well? And we'll, we'll put that in there as maybe a giveaway if people want to reach out. Absolutely. Uh, questions. Thank you very much, mate. Appreciate that. And uh, we've been really fortunate to have your business partner, Steve, and we've got the, the, the second half. I'm not sure it's better half. We'll, we'll call you guys equals. <laughs> um, but I want to say thank you so much, mate. And if you are, if anyone listening is keen to have a chat with Victor and his team at Right Property Group, we'll include the details. As always, you do your research, you find the team, you find who's aligned to you and, and, the, and the strategy that you're trying to build your portfolio on, just like a builder, the style, the design, you, you align yourself with a particular builder. The same goes for your wealth building as well. So you find the right team that's on that journey and the style that resonates with yourself as well. So I really hope you've found this episode helpful. If you've got some questions, awesome. Send them in. If you've got some reviews for us, even better as well. And that's a wrap for another episode of the Australian Property Investment Podcast. Until next time, take care.